from across the seas over there. You know, way, way over there. And it's morning here, but it's afternoon there. I want you guys to welcome in Mr. Jeremy Theobald. So this guest actually attended UCL with Christopher Nolan, where they worked on a number of short films together. He went on to produce Nolan's debut feature, Following, in which he uh, also portrayed Bill as the lead role. Jeremy Theobald, a veteran actor, producer, has starred in a number of Nolan's projects since their UCL days, including Batman Begins and the film of this episode, Tenet. How are you doing today, Jeremy? I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for calling me veteran. <laughs> well, according to your ID, IMDB and your resume, you're quite the, the savvy veteran. So we appreciate you coming on with us. One thing I wanted to ask, uh, I know we'll jump right into it. Uh, we did our research and with you and Christopher, of course, uh, you, your UCL days, when you guys first started working on shorts like Doodlebug and Larceny. Back in those days, I've read that you guys, you know, working during the day, trying to get these films out. What, how, can you tell us a little bit about that time with filmmaking, having a regular job, trying to do these things, and how it began a relationship between you and Christopher? Yes, yeah, so we, um, we met um, at, at college, um, uh, at university, University College London, where we were both studying, and um, Chris's uh, girlfriend, now wife, uh, Emma Thomas, and producer of all of his uh, films, uh, was there as well. Um, we all met through a mutual acquaintance called Ivan, who was the gaffer on, uh, on following. I was running uh, a drama society. Chris was running the film society, and uh, we kind of hooked up. He had a great idea for a short film last week. He wanted to shoot it on a weekend uh, with, with a couple of rolls of black and white 16 mil in, in one location in his flat just off Tottenham Court Road in London. And... Uh, and it was a great little script. It was it had a twist in it. It was funny, uh, and yeah, I, I jumped to the chance. I'd not done a lot of film acting before, so it was uh, a really steep learning curve for me. Um, and that did um, that, that worked out okay. We we did a little film festival in the UK uh, for short films, and then Chris came to me afterwards with uh, the script for following and said, look, I want you to play the lead in this. I'd kind of sort of like written it with you in mind and uh, and would you help me produce it as well? And by that, you know, it's, it was, uh, do you have access to uh, locations? Can we use your flat? Have you got friends who are actors who might want to give up a year of their time to be able to do this? Uh, and yeah, I mean, the story of following has been it's pretty well told. It was made for six thousand mm. uh, dollars. We filmed it uh, on one day a week on Saturdays for almost a year, uh, and um, and then it, it, it kind of took off from there when it went to the San Francisco Film Festival, um, in which I literally carried the uh, the, the print over uh, on the plane with me, and. Um, from there, it got bought by Next Wave Films, blown up to 35 mil and taken to Toronto uh, Film Festival, and it got sold there for distribution in the U.S. and, uh, and in Europe. And, and that was, yeah, kind of the start of, of Chris's career, which was, uh, uh, as we all know now, has been rather successful. <laughs> wow. <Yeah>, rather. <laughs> and I just want to be clear, did you say his first budget ever was $6,000? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was $6,000. So, so no one got paid uh, at the time, and we had we borrowed equipment from the Film Society at UCL, uh, and, and Chris bought one roll of black and white 16 millimeter film a week uh, and processed it uh, and telecined it onto DigiBeta and then you know put together a sort of like a rough cut each week, looked at the rushes, or what we needed to do, what we needed to cover, uh, and then eventually put it all together on uh, on DigiBeta as a, as, a, as a final edit, um, and then outputted it to VHS, sent it to film festivals when you know there was no film freeway in those days, <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, and that's when we then had to when it was accepted, we then had to go back and do the neg cut and, and do prints, and that cost another like $4,000 or something like that. So then we had to raise some more money. Um, so yeah, the only thing that we spent money on was, was the film and uh, some, some cheese and some bread for, for catering. 
<laughs> and it's it's now recognized as part of the Criterion Collection, correct? Uh, yeah, it's on DVD. Um, it came out on the Criterion Collection in, uh, on DVD in the US, uh, and they did a, um, uh, a special timed version where the uh, where it's, they actually re-edit it and put it together in chronological order. Uh, and I think that there's, uh, there's an interview with Chris on that as well, talking about how we made it. Uh, I think it's on I think it's on Amazon and on iTunes in the US uh, as well, available for purchase and download. Yeah, I saw with the um, if you have the uh, yeah the IFC Movie Pass, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. So definitely check it out. So with with Christopher Nolan's films, like I, I noticed you mentioned Time in that one, and with uh, Memento, Time seemed to be a pretty big um, theme in that. And then of course with Tenet, um, Time plays a huge role in it. Is that is that it seems to be a running theme in his films? Is that something that always interested him? Yeah, absolutely. What happens in following is a, as a, as a fractured narrative. So there's uh, chronologically, there are three timelines that play throughout the, the film and, and you cut in between those uh, and you start to be able to, to piece together uh, the whole story uh, from that. And that was something that, that Chris was really interested in, um, you know, right from the off. And he's played with that sort of fractured timeline before and he's played with it in Memento and he's done it you know, uh, in other films. And, uh, and with Tenet, I think what is unique is that for the first time is actually taking time and making it and making it go forwards and backwards, which is something that you can only do in, in film. You yeah. know, the, the, the time travel is one thing, but you can't, you know, nobody saw things go backwards and forwards until somebody actually filmed something and made that happen. So... Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that's been keeping him awake at night for, for a few years now. There were no VFX effect, effects with that scene, the, the the car scene, to where like the, like they brought in professional drivers from all over the world, and you probably know this. There were no VFX. Is that normally his style, or does he really want to try to, try to keep it as you know as visual as possible, so you don't think anything crazy is going on? Yeah, I mean, uh, Chris is fairly uh, well known for for eschewing um, the, the the CGI approach and and to try and do as much in camera as possible. Uh, uh, and I think one of the main stunt drivers was uh, was Jim, the guy who flipped the truck. Uh, I'm Batman, two thousand uh, uh, Dark Knight. Batman, Batman. Dark Knight, the guy who flipped. So he's uh, yeah, he was there, and they shut down. Uh, like a five-mile section of freeway in Estonia for three weeks to be able to shoot that. Um, and it's, so, yeah, they was, uh, I don't know how many lanes it was, but it was, yeah, it's, it's five miles long that they had, and they just locked it off at the end, and they said, this is, this is your parking lot, this is your playground for the next three weeks. Get on with it. <laughs> so, um uh, but, but to your question, yeah. So it, it is. It was all. It was all filmed, and a lot of the reverse um, stuff that you see is not reversed in post. It's it's actually in the IMAX camera and the Panasonic cameras. They were running the film backwards through the camera and just filming it like that. So the the shot of uh, the bow. Uh, they're on the icebreaker and you have a shot looking down on the bow and the, and the waves are splashing backwards over it. Yeah, that's that's all just done with an IMAX being poked out of a little porthole and running the film backwards through that camera. It's not it's not a post-production effect, awesome. um, which is, yeah, insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Jeremy, I wanted to talk about this because, again, all of us have favorite actors, directors, people that we want to work with. Now, in 1998, of course, you do the following. You get the lead in that film. And then fast forward is 2005. You just brought up Batman. So that's a good segue. You're doing Batman Begins. How does something like that transpire to where there's a gap and of, of the working? But then, of course, you still have the relationship with Christopher. So do you guys keep in touch? Was there a friendship? What transpired to get this thing going? One. Yeah, we still uh, we keep in touch. One of the um, really beautiful and, and touching things about uh, Chris and Emma is that they stayed in touch with all of us who worked on on following. And for every film since Batman Begins, we've all been invited to the premiere. So we mm-hmm. meet up every couple of years and we go and sit in an IMAX theater and watch Chris's film before you know before anyone else sees it. 
go to the party afterwards and I meet up and chat and say that was really interesting. <laughs> you know, how did you do this? And yeah, and uh, and so we're we're still in touch. And it's it's a question of just sort of when I have uh, when I have time and when he has time and when he has space for to to be able to you know to give me one of those uh, little roles. He he's used his uncle a fair amount as well. Um, John Nolan was uh, the police officer in following, and he was in Batman Begins. Lucy was in Batman Begins, who plays the blonde in following. Um, and uh, I think John was in Dunkirk as well. Uh -huh. So, yeah, it's uh, it's nice to be able to, to, to meet up and, and jump back into uh, working with the guy again. Uh, it's just it's tremendous fun um, every time you go on set with him. It's a little peculiar to, to go back on set, and uh, you know Chris doesn't have mobile, and he doesn't really use email. So you know, all my sort of like conversations with Emma on email, and then with the casting director through my agent, and when you're going to turn up and stuff like that, and you go and do your your fitting in a sort of hotel in London, and then you just you know your car, his call times are ridiculous. So a car come and picks you up at 5 a.m. from your hotel, and you know you're bleary eyed, and you're you're in makeup sitting next to John David Washington, going, "Oh hi," um, <laughs> uh, you know, at half past five in the morning, and then you're in costume and you you walk on to set and Chris is there, and it's six thirty, and he just comes up and gives you a big bear hug, like you know, nothing's changed. Awesome. So it's uh, it's it's, fine. it's fantastic. With the following, you know, like you said, you're you're doing it in between day jobs um, on a on a, a small budget, and then um, you know you go from that to something like Tenant, which is like one of the largest budget films ever made. Um, can you one just talk about the trials and tribulations of what you know? Because I think it's helpful for other filmmakers because everybody has to start there where they have to they have to be 200%, 100% in, you know, regular life to make things keep going until the dream turns into a reality and they're given 100% of the dream as well. So that gets really strenuous, I'm sure. And I think it's, you know, helpful to hear from somebody that's made it to the other side, you know, what that experience was like for you, um, like on uh, following. Um, and then just witnessing firsthand that evolution from you know, working on a film like Following to working on a film like Tenet, how much still remains the same in that process, even with the money involved? Yeah, sure. So, okay, let's, uh, let's yeah, let's go back to the beginning and talk about Following and uh, uh, and the way we made that and how we made that. So we, we made it with what we had that was available. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was $6,000. It was an incredibly small cast. Uh, we had, you know, one camera that was the 16 mil. Uh, we did it in black and white because we didn't really have that many lights or any lights to be able to do it. We used a, a lot of natural light. So the, the film noir sort of style uh, of thriller really worked um, with that. Things like uh, when you're doing really low budget stuff, it's really difficult to... Uh, make guns look realistic uh, because they are always filmed in at the end. Every time you point one or wave one around, it looks like it's plastic. It doesn't look real. They don't make the right sort of sound. You don't get the sort of right reaction when you want to go when they go off. Mm -hmm. So use something else. So 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 Chris uses a hammer uh, for the main weapon uh, in in following um, because that's readily available and it's cheap and you can make a rubber one that looks. Uh, you know, really realistic. Sure. Um, and it's, it's a, so those things are about working with what you have a, available. Um, it's about it's about making films. Filmmakers make films. They go out and they make films with whatever they can. Yeah. Uh, and you don't have to wait for, you know, funding to come along to be able to get your $2 million project off, off the ground. You know, mm -hmm. we made a film for $6,000 and it got bought and it got distributed. Yes, times are different now. Uh, you know, we were particularly lucky to to be arriving in the time of uh, guerrilla filmmaking of El Mariachi and Blair Witch Project and stuff like that. But it is still possible to get to get your stuff seen. Um, what's what's the difference? Chris uh, says that the the biggest change. 
for him was going from following to a memento with a professional crew, which was $8 million or thereabouts as a, um, uh, as a budget, uh, as opposed to you know him having the camera on his shoulder and mm-hmm. working with friends from college. That was the biggest change. Running Everything after that, up to uh, the Batman Begins, is just a matter of scale. Mm-hmm. Um, and Batman Begins was insane. You know, we the for the film the, the scene that I was in, we were in Cardington and Bedfordshire, which is an old uh, airship hangar. So this thing, this 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 airship hangar is like half a mile long and three hundred feet wide and one hundred and fifty feet tall. So the Opera House, uh, the frontest piece of the Opera House, was just was built inside that aircraft hangar. It's not a real Opera House. It was built by the carpenters and uh, and the set builders in there so that they could do a night shoot during the day because it costs less and everyone doesn't have to stay up overnight um, and get tired. And there were, yeah, hundreds of people working working on that, on that set. Um, and it was very structured as a, a way of working. And uh, Chris talked about the fact that, you know, he's extremely proud of the way that they worked and, and the way that, uh, that Wally Fister shot it. But, but what they wanted to do, what he did as a reaction to that, to go to prestige afterwards, is to oh, try and work with it. a much smaller crew in a much more uh, spontaneous way. Uh, and he's tried to take that through a lot of the films since. And certainly the, the feeling that I got when I came on to set the tenant was this was just a really tight group, a small, really tight group of people. Uh, they were all fantastically welcoming to me. Half of them, you know, most of them didn't know who I was. A few of them had seen following, a few of them knew that I, you know, I've been working with Chris uh, since the beginning. Uh, but a lot of them didn't know who I was, but they were all really kind, really welcoming, you know, it's fantastic to have you on board. But it was just a really tight ship. And he talks, Chris talks about having, trying to create this arena in which, in which performers can really be spontaneous, get their stuff out there, go to the edges of, of their performance, uh, uh, because that's, that's where the gold is. That's what's really special. And that's what you can take out of filmmakers like from a $6,000 movie to all the way up to, you know, whatever um, tenant costs, $225 million or something like that. It's about the performances. It's mm-hmm. about creating that space in which actors can, can really do something special. With a film like Tenet, with most of Nolan's films, from Prestige to Inception to Memento, if there's one, he's prob- he probably has the record for most fan theories out there to these films. Everybody leaves out thinking one thing or, or another, and I know this hasn't been released everywhere, so there are no spoiler alerts here, but even John David Washington, you mentioned him earlier, was saying, hey, listen, I don't even, I had to re- read it two or three times, I even don't even know what to think. Now, he's the lead, he's the, he's the protagonist of the film, and so when you see something like that, like without you giving anything away, if you li- after your screening of it, you walking out, what did it leave you thinking or feeling? Uh, yeah, so like um, just to, just to go back a, a, a second, when Chris first gave me the the script to follow, and like I said, it's got a fractured narrative in it, uh, and there are three timelines that run through it, and and I was reading it, going, okay, you yeah, know, I kind of get it, but as an actor, I had to pull it apart, put it back together in chronological order. So that I could understand my character arc and what I was supposed to be doing on any any particular day, and and Tenet is several orders of magnitude more complicated than that. So I'm not surprised that, that John David didn't, you know, doesn't doesn't get it entirely. <laughs> I didn't get it entirely. I bought the script now, uh, book now, so that I can read it again. Uh, and I want to go and see it a few more times. The ride home, me and him left the movies. We were like, so we're very educated. We've seen a lot of films. We've done films. Uh, what was it? what happened? I wanted him to speak first, and then I could speak. So I'm glad you felt kind and, of the same. And it way. was a quiet ride home. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's and it's, it's a film that I'm gonna you know I'm gonna keep on watching. It's gonna stay with you for years. You're just gonna keep on discovering stuff about it and and, and reading stuff about it and thinking about it. And it's uh, you know it's uh, and that's that's kind of the beauty of the films that he makes is that they are the you know, they, they are these enormous, immersive pieces of, of art in which you can just, you know, you can jump in, you can watch it once and go, that was great. 
or you can spend hours and hours thinking about it. Um, uh, I'm really going for it. My my strange take on it is is that it's kind of a love story without uh, without trying to reveal too many spoilers. Um, the relationship between Elizabeth Debicki uh, uh, and Kenneth Branagh is very similar to the one between the blondes and the bald guy and following, uh, mm. and that uh, there's, he has a hold over her and there's that sort of like abusive relationship that's mm. going on. Uh, and, and, and John David Washington, as, as the protagonist, is... Um, you know, goes in and uh, uh, and uh, has to has to break that up. Um, uh, I think that's about all I can say. Now. Okay. Otherwise, we are going to get into the, the realm of the plot. What, yeah. what happened? Moving on outside of Tenet. Uh, so you know, according to IMDb, at least, it looks like you took a ten-year hiatus in your producing. You returned to produce Convergence, which is now available on Amazon Prime. If you want to check it out. Uh, that was in 2019, where you also produced a short film, Custodian, um, and both films you starred in as well. How, how different is the experience between showing up to set as an actor and showing up wearing the producer hat as well? I've been lucky enough to work with directors whereby um, it's a collaborative process. Uh, so as an actor, you get, to, you get to have a voice and you get to have a say uh, in in the way that the whole thing is shot and put together and the design and, you know, uh, 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 and even, you know, down to the set dressing is sort of like, do you think your character would have, you know, these books on the shelf or, or, or do you think you would have this or, you know, what is it, uh, what would they wear today? And, um, you know, looking through, uh, you know, costumes and different shirts and jackets and things like that. Um, and certainly with Steve Johnson on, on uh, Convergence, uh, it was an incredibly collaborative process, and he wanted me on board as a as a producer because he wanted my input on 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 everything, from the you know from the plot and the writing uh, and the structure of the of the script uh, down to yeah as I said you know costume and set dressing and, and particular shots mm -hmm. uh, and acting. Um, it can be tough sometimes because you get too caught up in that sort of stuff and you don't do enough you then have to remove yourself from that and then get yourself in character and think about the theme that you're actually doing uh, and try and be you know in the moment and spontaneous and, and feel all of those things um so it's it, it can be tough but it's i think it's incredibly rewarding most of the time because you have far more skin in the game effectively <laughs> Yeah, I have to say congratulations on Convergence because it's not easy to take 10 years off and then, because at least from producing and acting, then come back in with, like you say, with both your hands in the pot making this thing happen. You can't truly flesh out your character. You, It's like you're trying to give all to everybody. You're responsible so, for so many things. So when I find out and I do my research and I figure out that you swept film festivals, a lot of them with this film, to me it's even more, you know, just something that you should be paid homage for because I know how hard it is. So talk about, you know, saying, hey, I don't know what's going to happen with this film, but I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to produce it. I'm, I'm in it. I'm doing everything. And then to see the success that it's had, how rewarding is that? Uh, it's fantastic. I mean, the, the, there, isn't, there isn't much of a, of a greater feeling than going to a film festival and, and being awarded uh, best film um, because it's, it's just the most enormous relief that... that you, you find other people who actually really value your work and, and, uh, and the amount of you know, time and effort that, that you put into it. Uh, it's not an easy watch uh, as a film if you, if you want to pick it up on, on Amazon Prime. Um, uh, and I'll let you into a secret, it's another $6,000 movie as well. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have people just, you know, to appreciate your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, before we uh, wrap up the interview, I just want to remind everyone that's listening to, uh, well, first of all, to thank you to Jeremy for joining us and to check out Convergence on Amazon Prime, uh, check out Following on Amazon Prime. Um, I definitely will be checking them out. Um, what other projects can we look out for in the future? I made a short film called 
uh, Celtic Cross in Washington, D.C. in January earlier this year. Um, and that has been written up as a feature now. We're hoping to get that funded and made next year as well. Um, so the script for that has been doing some screenwriting festivals uh, and it's been doing pretty well. So, yeah, we're hoping to, to get that out. I think I think Celtic Cross has got its first festival screening in South Africa, but it's an online festival, so you can... Uh, you can buy tickets for that and watch it online as well. Before you go, Jeremy, I just want to tell you, uh, you're you're our, you're a type, you you are our type of guy because with me and him again, we love every aspect of film. We always say here, if our bills could be paid, we do this for free. Because again, I'm just listening to you like you're you have the same look on your face from the six thousand dollar budget to the two hundred and five million dollar budget. It's like, hey, I'm working, I'm doing what I love. This is my life. This is my passion. And these are the type of people we want to have on TTFT because this is our passion. So I I definitely want to thank you for coming on and remaining one of the true thespians that we have in the field. Thanks very much, guys, for having me on. It's been a fantastic time chatting with you, talking film with you, and uh, talking Christmas films with you as well. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and all of the uh, continued success in the future to you. Yes, and have a great afternoon. We're going to have a great morning, but you have a great afternoon out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. That's the trailer.